mathematical objects are things like integers, real numbers, sets, functions, etc. Here are some mathematical statements. There are infinitely many prime numbers. For every real number a, the equation x squared plus a equals zero has a real root. The square root of two is irrational. If pn denotes the number of primes less than or equal to the natural number n, then as n becomes very large, p of n approaches n divided log e of n. Not only are mathematicians interested in statements like these, they are, above all, interested in knowing which statements are true and which are false. The truth or falsity in each case is demonstrated not by observation or measurement or experiment as in the natural sciences, but by a proof. In this course, we look at some different ways of proving statements. In the case of my four examples, one, three and four are true, but two is false. Let me show you a proof of the first statement. It's due to the ancient Greek mathematician Euclid, who lived around 350 BCE. We show that if we list the primes, P1, P2, P3, etc., the list continues forever. Well, suppose we've reached some stage n, so we've listed P1, P2, P3, up to Pn. Can we find another prime to continue the list? If we can always find another prime, then the list goes on forever, and we've shown that there are infinitely many primes. Well, can we? Well, here's a clever trick that Euclid described in his famous book Elements in 350 BC. Look at the number n defined as follows. Set n equal to p1 times p2 times p3 all the way up to pn, multiply them all together, and add 1. Clearly, n is bigger than pn. So if n happens to be prime, we found a prime number bigger than pn, and we can continue the list. If n is not prime, then it's going to be divisible by a prime, say p. Now, p cannot be any of the primes p1, p2, p3, up to pn. Because if you divide any of those primes into n, that prime will divide into this part, and then there's a remainder of 1. So p cannot be any of those. Why? Because dividing them leaves a remainder of 1. So p is bigger than pn. That means we've found a prime number bigger than pn. Either way, if n is prime, or if it's not prime, we've shown that there's a bigger prime than pn, which means the list can always be continued. And that proves that there are infinitely many primes. Let's just take another look at what we've done. We start with a list of all of the primes. Or we try to list all of the primes. We have to show that we can do that and keep going. OK, so we start with a list of the primes. We assume we've reached some stage n. n could be a 10, a million, a billion, a trillion, whatever. We've reached some stage, and we show that we can always find another prime bigger than the last one. How do we do that? Well, there's a clever idea. We look at this number big N, which means you multiply the first little n primes, that's a little n there, you multiply them together and you add 1. N is certainly bigger than the last one in, in that sequence. So if big N is prime, then it's a prime bigger than PN. Now, we're not saying that big N would be the next prime after PN. In fact, it almost certainly wouldn't be, because big N is a lot bigger than these numbers. So this number is a lot bigger than PN. So this isn't going to be the next prime, almost certainly. But that doesn't matter. We've shown that there is another prime, and whatever the next prime is, we'll put it onto the list. The alternative was that n wasn't prime, in which case it's divisible by a prime, and we call it p. Now, that prime p can't be any of these. Why? Well, this is why we defined n the way we did. If you, defy, if you divide n by any of these primes, you're left with a remainder of 1. So the prime that divides n can't be any of these. It must be a different one. If it's a different one, it's bigger than pn. So again, we've found a prime that's bigger than pn. Is this prime p the next prime after pn? Well, it might be, but there's no reason to assume it is, and it doesn't matter. 
The point is we found a prime bigger than Pn, so once again the list can be continued. Either way, the list can be continued. This is the clever trick that makes it work. Defining n that way, and we define n that way to make sure that if there's a prime dividing big N, it won't be equal to any of those. Theorem was proved. There are infinitely many primes. How about that? So we've proved the first of our four examples. There are infinitely many prime numbers. That one's true. What about the second one? Well, it says that for every real number a, the equation x squared plus a equals zero has a real root. That turns out to be false. To show that it's false, all you need to do is find a single real number a for which the equation does not have a real root. Well, why don't we just take a equals one? Then we know that the equation x squared plus 1 equals 0 does not have a root because there's no number that you can square, no real number that you can square, such that when you add 1 to it, you get 0. The square of any real number is positive. And you take a positive number and add 1, you end up with a positive number. Because there is a real number a for which the equation does not have a root, that shows that the statement that for every real number there's a root is false. What about number three? Well, that one turns out to be true, and we're going to prove that's true later in the course. The fourth one, this rather complicated looking statement about the distribution of the prime numbers, that's a very famous result that was proved at the, uh, oh, about just over a hundred years ago, at the end of the 19th century. It's known as the prime number theorem. So this one is true prime number theorem. And there we are. 